Good evening and welcome to the Henry Schein Dental Academy webinar series. My name is Adam and I'll be your moderator. Tonight we're joined by Dr. Jonathan Ng as he discusses how intraoral scanning and 3D printing can deliver same day workflows. At any point during the webinar, if you do have a question, please type it into the Q&A section of your control panel. We'll answer some at the end and also we'll get back to you via email within two business days. Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation live or on demand. And this webinar is sponsored by Sprint Ray. Dr. Ng, welcome. Thank you so much for such a wonderful introduction. It's such an honor and privilege for me to be here with all of you. I wish I could be in person and live with you all. But for now, you know, doing things webinar has made things much easier for us to communicate, uh, even across country, across the nations and across the world. So uh, my name is Dr. Jonathan Ng. Uh, as mentioned, I am a prosthodontist here in the city of Vancouver. Uh, rains a lot here. So unlike, you know, in California where it's sunny or the East Coast where it's snowing, but uh, we basically have rain all year round. But uh, I'm excited to be able to share with you a little bit about how in my practice, I'm going to be using the technology we're going to talk about. So for me, digital impressions is extremely uh, uh, passionate about that. I am because I did my master's thesis on uh, digital impressions. I basically compared how they were compared to conventional impressions. And not only that, we're now able to use that technology to do things like, and we're gonna talk about tonight uh, or today, splints and occlusal uh, guards. So today uh, the topic is the power of integration. How we're gonna integrate it into your practice. I'm gonna show you how I do it in my office. So hopefully you can uh, glean some of that uh, information for your practice as well. As mentioned before, I'm a prosthodontist and my website is easy to remember, prosthodontist.ca. So that's uh, probably easy for anybody to remember, prosthodontist.ca. Uh, but uh, easiest for us to find each other is on social media. So we have Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and of course, Twitter. So uh, as you know, technology moves so fast. Technology allows people to communicate instantly. And so similarly with that, technology and dentistry is moving very quickly as well. So what I'm going to do is actually something that I like to always do and wish we could do live in person. But I'm going to take a quick video and make an instant story about this instant story. So uh, look for me on Instagram and see you'll see this as well. Hey, everyone. How's it going? We're here recording our webinar. We're live with those uh, listening about splints. So hopefully you guys can uh, log on, have a listen to it as well, too. This is my office, proper background, so not a Zoom background. But we'll see you guys soon. All right, so people wonder, what was that all about? Uh, go to Instagram and you'll see that because, like as I mentioned, that's how people communicate now. They communicate so quickly through technology that uh, same for you. I think you'll be able to see how uh, not only in our everyday life, but in dentistry as well. So as I mentioned, I'm in the city of Vancouver. This is a view from my office. People will say, oh, that's just a Google image. But I'll let you know that uh, basically my office this is literally what we see out the window. In my Instagram, you can see here a picture of my uh, my computers as I'm planning implants and other things. Uh, basically, we're looking at the same view that you see there. Uh, the clouds roll in, we basically look at uh, above the clouds kind of view and, and the sun sets, looks as nice as well. But for me, I love technology and as I mentioned, I love scanning technology. And so I was the very first in Canada to have the Trios 4. So I was able to talk about it, un unbox it, unveil it. And if you have a chance to go to my YouTube page, you'll get a chance to see that. I basically compare, you know, the scanners and stuff like that. So I know it's a shameless plug, but go to Vancouver Pross uh, on uh, on YouTube. You'll also see a couple of things like, uh, you know, unboxings of things like uh, the Sprint Ray uh, printer, which we're going to talk a lot about today. Uh, so if you want to find out a little bit more about what that looks like, go to my uh, uh, my page. You'll see that there. And so uh, hopefully you can subscribe, take a look, and you'll see new videos coming from there as well. So this is uh, prior to the pandemic, we were able to meet in person. And as you can see here, uh, lots of people, there's not a whole lot of social distance or physical distance there. I want you to take a look at this picture and I want you to see and look for me. There's a little bit of like a where's Waldo. Sorry, the ambulance and fire is going by. But anyways, I want you to look at the picture. See if you can find me. I'll give you a hand. I'll help out a little bit. See right there. There's me, again, not a lot of social distance or physical distance. Hopefully one day uh, I'll be able to travel and, and see you all and doing this kind of thing again. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned, being together is sort of why we're able to learn from each other, uh, teach and, and, and gain information from everybody. So I'm hoping to be able to do this once again with all of you in person. Uh, but until then, we do things virtually this way. Okay, so in the short time that we have today, I want to talk a little bit about various things. So we're going to focus a lot on a few things, but uh, of course, what is digital? Why are we doing it and, and, and why is it important for you in your practice? We're going to talk about what the scanning workflow is, especially for splints, because uh, scanning is what I do every single day. Every patient, every time is what I like to say. But how do, you, how do we do it for splints? How, why is it important? Uh, what is a digital splints workflow? 
how do I do it in my office and how are you going to make it easy for you in your practice? Uh, 3D printing and post-processing, what's the technique? Uh, what are the steps and how do we do it? And of course, advancements uh, for your practice. How are the things that we're going to talk about today going to impact what you do today and tomorrow? But I want to start with a quote, and I always start with this quote. It's one of my favorite quotes of all time. It's basically, whosoever desires constant success must change conduct with the times. So even in the 1400s, they knew that for us to be up to date and current, you got to change with the times. And currently, times are changing. And so it's important for us to know that that's why we're listening to this webinar. That's why we're learning about things, because things are changing all around us constantly. So that's completely true, obviously, about, you know, our everyday life is you see cell phones. You know, how many of us have had a phone like this maybe back in the day, right? I used it for self-defense uh, in those old Chinese movies. They jump out and hit somebody. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, basically, it got us in touch with our families. So it did something for us. It basically helped us make sure people know where we are. But that's what it. It doesn't really do a whole lot other than that. You can't text anybody. You can't check your email. But nowadays, we all have a smartphone. So smart that I, in fact, I don't even know why they call smartphones anymore. I think every phone is a smartphone. But anyways, basically what we're doing is we're able to communicate with our families, let them know where we are, but a whole lot more. I think in our pockets and in our phones that you all have, uh, basically we're able to do more than the computers in the day of that other big brick phone could do. So uh, just a testament to how technology has changed in our everyday life. So what about in dentistry? You know, for us, you know, for me as a prosthodontist, you know, we do you know, wax ups, we basically had to do this uh, by hand, it would take any dental paid or dental student maybe a, a week to do a uh, dental lab technician, a good one, maybe a whole afternoon. Uh, but basically, we have one solid wax up. What if we needed to make a change, we'd have to send it back to the lab. Well, as you can see here on the right hand side of the screen, there's a, a digital wax up. So not only is it a digital mock up that we can make in seconds, but we can actually overlay on top of it. And underneath it, what the previous teeth look like patient can really see what it looks like to have these worn and chipped teeth and the actual planned pos position and shapes of the teeth. That's much better than this block of wax, which makes sense to you and I as a dentist or a dental professional, but patients have no idea. They just look and have no idea what that is. So because of that, the question we always ask and often are asked is, well, why do we got to go digital? I mean, doing dentistry, you know, for however many years in your career, you've been doing it so well, and why would we need digital? I think the question is not so, so much why, but what is digital? What is digital and how is it making everything that we do better? So as we look to that today is in, in our, in our uh, seminar, I'm going to talk about what it is that we can do with digital. But I want to basically uh, point out the fact that, you know, oftentimes people say that digital impressions is just taking an impression. You know, and I take PVS every day. I take alginate every day. And, you know, what? I'm the best PVS taker in the world. I haven't had trouble in my whole life. Well, it's not necessarily the impression taking skills. It's the actual impression itself. There's something wrong with the way that it's poured, uh, the expansion, contraction, all these other things, and there's tons of literature on it. But what I want to talk to you about today is that digital impressions is not just another version of that. It's not just capturing information and another way of taking imprint, but rather it's a transformation in the way of patient treatment. It changes completely the way that we can do things for our patients. Like never before could you do same day dentistry the way that I'm going to show you today. And also the accuracy, as I mentioned in the studies, showing how it's just more accurate now. So basically, remember this. It's not just an imprint, but it's a transformation in the way of patient treatment. Hopefully, uh, you can see some of that today, and I wish I had more time to talk about it. By you know, I spent a whole day, you know, seminars on this, but we'll talk about this one small part of it. But what is it, what and where can digital impressions make you better? There's a whole list of things, you know, from prepping teeth better to, uh, to, to being able to have more accuracy and things. But I want to basically focus on what it's going to do to making your practice more efficient in what you do. But what it happens, often happens when we ask, when we say to our patient, we say, you know what, you need an impression. What does a patient usually think? It's the first thing they say, think is, yay, I'm excited. Or do they think this? They basically say this. I know it's no picnic, but I will try to make it as comfortable as possible. All right, thanks. Now, we're going to have to make an impression. Oh, 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 I've got a little treat for you. Robin, bring in Stephen Baldwin's mold for Doug to look at. <laughs> Open wide. All right, now bite down. And, oh, okay. <laughs> Do your nose. Just breathe through your nose. Don't panic. I think uh, none of us have experienced that, right? It's not a thing that uh, you know that happens ever, right? 
Well, it's funny because it's true. You know, patients see this uh, on TV. They think it's funny because it happens to them. And so for many of us, uh, I think impressions are always kind of associated with this kind of thing. So we're not talking about how, you know, impressions are taken and all those things today. But I want to show you that basically that's sort of why it's such a problem. Now, oftentimes patients will think I'm going to gag. I'm going to have a problem with that. But the reason why they think this is because when you go to Google Images, you just Google dental impression. Just if you go ahead and do it to Google, the first few pictures you can see is something like this. This is what patients are seeing where they can say, my dentist said an impression. I'm going to Google that. And this is the first thing they see. I don't know if any patient is going to be like, oh my goodness, sign me up. I want to get that done right away. So the issue with that is not only that we're taking an impression of the glottis, what if you took a PVS impression or some sort of silicone impression that takes five minutes to set? I don't know how many patients would uh, be comfortable doing that. On the other hand, you know, you can see these ones, you know, get a little bit of a you know, side impression, which is kind of nice. But most concerning is unless you were planning to do this, was extract all the teeth at the same time. So, uh, you know, how many times have you seen mobile teeth and you're like, oh man, just praying that those teeth aren't going to come out in the impression. Well, in this case, this person, uh, it did. So uh, that's not my uh, case. That's just a Google image. But this is what patients are thinking. And so, as you can see, if you look at this picture, there's a reason why sometimes things like night guards don't fit and other things are tight because if you push an impression that hard, it's got to set, it's got to impress on those teeth. We're going to start moving teeth, we might even pull them out. So, uh, if you take a look at the way impressions are done, you know, it's very important for everything we do. As I mentioned, it's not just taking an imprint, it's a transformation in the way of patient treatment. So, you're going to see that basically, basically, we change the way we take care of our patients when we change the way we take our impressions. So if you take a look at LMT magazine, this is basically a lab technicians magazine looking at various things of lab technicians like look at. But one of the questions that they asked was, you know, what is the top challenge you have with your dentist or clients? And it's not, you know, they don't pay on time or their preparations are not are horrible. The number one is the impression taking skills. The impression taking skills. So basically we're giving them stuff that they can't work with. So if you give a, a lab something that's horrible to start with, they can't give you something good to, to come back. So again, you know, we just want to quickly talk a little bit about how digital impressions essentially is a fast way to do it. If you're not doing digital impressions yet, um, you know, this is why, you know, every single one of my patients are basically able to get a, a scan like this. The, the assistants are taking it within seconds. You know, they should not be waiting in the waiting room. The patients should be having a scan done if there's, if there's time ahead of their appointment. If you have regular uh, records of all your patients, you're going to be able to record how things are changing. And I'm going to show you why that's important as we look to why we're taking things like night guards and splints. So... You know, a, a sort of a brief reason as to why digital impressions are important. We, we, you know, we have a chance to talk about what and how they are and, of course, why they're important. But let's take a look and compare what it looks like compared to what we're always doing. So as, as you see on the left-hand side here, this is what we're classically, you know, done all the time. In fact, that alginate bowl is the same bowl, I think, that every one of us have used, no regardless of when you graduated dentistry. I think in the 30s and 40s and 50s, they were already using this kind of thing. So, and that little cup, that measuring cup is still the same. Uh, but basically, we mix... Very important, you have a smooth mix, right? And you put it in the patient's mouth. Just look at this patient's eyes. See it, sort of, sort of what the reaction is. And I think every one of our patients get the same reaction. You ready for that here? There. So that's that's sort of when it feels like, oh my goodness, I'm going to choke on this. And then you tell the patient to hold still, right? You got to take it out with a snap removal. Kind of like, kind of a quick removal. Ugh, and hopefully no teeth came out with it, right? So there's a huge problem with that. A lot of pressure, right, on the teeth. Now, if you took a look at the digital impression, I got a mirror in place and basically a wand that just skims across. So for those of you already taking digital impressions, this is nothing. This is sort of old hat. You guys are, are used to this. But for those of you who don't have digital impressions or are considering it, you see a huge difference in just basically the way that we capture images for our patients. Now, it's very important because, you know, for, for those of you who have a practice where every single one of your patients look like this, um, there's maybe not a whole lot of dentistry to do. We're doing cleanings, hygiene, and recalls. But for me, and I'm, for, I'm sure for most of you, patients come in every shape and size. We have basically patients that come with uh, various different needs, uh, but all of them, I believe, comes with the same focus as to what we need. So treatment planning, if we had a time to talk about that, it would all start from the same root. So we are starting from the same tree with various branches where everything is the same. So whether your patients are missing a tooth, or missing multiple teeth, uh, going to be missing all their teeth or have no teeth at all. I firmly believe that the, the treatment philosophy is the same. And so what we're going to talk about today, aside from night guards for patients who have no teeth, um, is, is the same. Now, that's not entirely true. I do make night guards for patients who have no teeth on one arch. You know, they, they feel their other teeth bite into the teeth or they have issue with uh, um, uh, loss of vertical dimension and really sore jaws. So we're making night guards for them just to support the jaw at night. So there is definitely a need for that. Okay, but let's talk about a patient because this is where uh, it's important for us to look at. And I think that it really helps us understand where things are at. So let's look at a patient, Evan. Evan is 48 years old. 
He comes to see my practice and he basically complains of uh, incisal translucency. He actually said those words. And we're not talking incisal translucency like beautiful, you know, Emax lithium basilica crowns where you got like really nice incisal edges. We're talking thinned out teeth chipping off. That's sort of what you see the, the lateral incisor there basically is ready to flake off. So Evan, he's 48 years old uh, and basically he looks like this. He's a good looking guy. He basically is a CEO of a, of a large company here in Vancouver, uh, has a lot of employees. And he basically says, you know, I, I have to smile like this. And he gives, gives me this little kind of propped forward posture, you know, uh, bite smile. I say, why? What's wrong with that? And he goes, because if I smile like this, I feel really self-conscious. And he said, and in his words, he actually said, in fact, I feel like a hobo. He says, I, I'm talking to all my employees and I just feel kind of really conscious about the fact that my teeth are like chipped off. It's like I got in a fight or something. And so that's sort of where he talked about these incisal or gut translucencies. I'm sure you heard it somewhere along the lines, but basically this is his issue. So this is important for us to see because many of your patients are like this in your practice. And how do we prevent it? And how do we treat it? So as you can see, you know, we have a lot of forward posture. So sometimes habits, maybe a class three, you know, occlusion, all that kind of thing happening. But when we look at our patients, we basically have not a lot of room. Those upper incisors are worn away. The lower incisors are biting right up into it. But as Evan and many of your patients are as well, they say, you know, I don't grind my teeth at night. You know, I don't need to wear a night guard. I sleep with my mouth open. I'm snoring like crazy. I don't, I don't need a night guard. But as you can tell, you know, he's got a lot of worn teeth. So as we take a look, what we do is we scan every patient every time. So I said, Evan, let's take a scan of your teeth and it'll show you sort of what it looks like over time. Nine months later, he comes back and we basically uh, uh, compare. We look at how wear has happened on his molars. We got 0.85 millimeters. Didn't seem like a whole lot. Didn't seem concerned. So we move to the front. We take a look at his front teeth. Now, if you look at before and after nine months, we see a difference of 0.21 millimeters. And people say 0.21 millimeters, that's a big deal. That's like two hairs on top of each other. You know, what's the big deal? Well, nine months, 0.21. What about 18 months? You know, that's 0.4. What about 36 months, you do the math, you start to add up and sooner or later, he's gonna have worn out teeth to nothing. And so as he's not a believer in sort of his teeth wear, this made him a believer. He looked at that and said, yes, that is teeth wear. So we decided to move his teeth. We did some orthodontics, moved his teeth. I did some clear liners to create room, pre-prosthetic ortho. As you can see on the left-hand side of the screen here, this is a, a, a time-lapse of how that movement happens. This is the same time-lapse that we used for sort of the wear of his teeth as well. But this is just more dramatic to show you. Uh, as Evan's not a, uh, um, a believer in the fact that his teeth were wearing. He also was not a believer his teeth are moving. So we showed him this and it was, uh, you know, patient monitoring made the difference. So as you can see on the right hand side now, it's just showing that we've created more room, allowing us to have space to do the crowns we want. If we were to do finish lines on all those anterior teeth, we'd be looking at root canals on every single tooth. But in this case, we created room by opening up space. So all you have to do is create a finish line on the back with pretty much no uh, cingulum uh, lingual reduction. So with that said, you know, basically we started with those worn, worn teeth. I want to quickly show you, and if we had time to talk about this, how I use a lot of digital planning uh, to, to make this happen. So I use a, a system, a program called Bellis 3D. Uh, basically, I take a 3D scan of his face. We do smile designing and we do all this to kind of create where his teeth are going to go. So this is all important as part of the treatment planning process. But it is very important for us to build the image and the, and the sort of the situation for the patient. So they know sort of what's happening with their teeth, the grinding, the wear, so that as part of the entire treatment, we talk about splints and night guards from the very beginning. We're not thinking of it as an afterthought. We don't say you need a night guard at the end of everything, you know, after we're all done. We've talked about it beforehand. So when he sees his teeth like this and what it's going to look like with the waxed up position, he understands. Now, why don't we have a picture of an articulator? You guys are all probably wondering, oh my goodness, I hate articulators. I put mine away in the cupboard, you know, the moment I graduated. I basically put it in a box and I don't even know where the key is. Uh, and the reason why is because you know, a lot of words scare us. Things like sagittal condylar path, hinge type, bend and angle, all this kind of stuff. It doesn't make sense. Sometimes we just send it to a lab and say, you know what, you deal with it. Uh, but you know what? The issue is, you know, sometimes people say, well, our digital impression is good enough for an articulator. And all of a sudden it's important again. Well, I'm going to tell you that it is, it is definitely important. And also digital impressions are allowing us to do it and do it well. So what does that look like? You know, if we have a digital articulator, you know, basically we have the, the, the articulation. Uh, we can basically move the uh, bended angles and all the positions that we want. But it was somewhat arbitrary. Basically, we kind of create it and make it up. Just a computer screen was showing some uh, models moving around. And uh, that's about it. But People now say, well, how is that relevant? How is that going to be important for what we do? Well, especially when it comes to splints and other things, we want to have different canine rise and guidance patterns. At least for me, when I create mine, I like a Michigan South splint or something with a you know canine guidance. So we create that. We basically copy that from a patient's actual movement. Now you say, well, how do we actually get patients movement digitally? 
Well, I'd like to show you that at least with the TRIO scanner, I'm able to use what's called patient-specific motion. This is extremely important because bite registrations are static, no matter what you do. A bite registration is a bite. Take a bite and you got it. What about the movements? You know, typically we would take a, you know, a side bite and kind of make a check bite, put that on an articulator and set all your angles. Well, now we can actually reverse calculate that into a patient's mouth by actually seeing where they grind. So in the patient's mouth with the camera of the three shape being so fast, we literally are scanning the actual movement of the teeth. So here's a patient's full arch. So as you can see here, basically what we're doing is we're scanning the teeth as it moves side to side. And it actually recreates in real time the lateral excursions, protrusive movements. And for that reason, we have the patient's actual jaw movement recorded. So we can take that and reverse calculate it into the articulator and have actual articulator movements so that the jaw in the articulator is exactly what the patient's teeth are. So this is helpful because obviously if we're going to be making restorations, you know, we want to make sure that they make sense. Second, if we're making splints, we use this so that we have proper articulation on the digital articulator. Extremely beneficial. This is sort of like, you know, a little bit next level when it comes to getting everything planned, but it's just to show you that, yes, the technology is there. So as we saw this uh, this image before, this is uh, Evan's, you know, wax up, you know, just showing what we could do with uh, his potential teeth. And then putting it on an articulator and I incorporate all that into his Bellus 3D scan and all that works together. So if we had time, I was going to go over, I would go over smile design and all this other stuff. Uh, that's uh, for another webinar. If you ask your uh, uh, your team last night, uh, you know, maybe I'll do one of those webinars too. But basically, we talk about smile design, how to create all that and bring it all together. But let's go back to Evan and what sort of happened. So basically, you know, we talked about chipped and worn teeth. We talked about how he's got grinding habits and patterns. So now we talked about uh, with him splints before we even started anything. We basically had a plan for a, a night guard at the end of his treatment before we even started any pre-prosthetic ortho. So that plan is always there to begin with. So in the end, he ended up having uh, zirconia layered zirconia crowns uh, because his grinding habit is still there. But uh, basically some veneers on the lower, some uh, nice reconstruction of his teeth. And you see very nice result for him. So he wants to protect that. Obviously, he clearly wants to make sure his teeth don't go back to this. So as you can see, you know, we moved a little bit of the midline. Here's just a little morphing of the picture. You can see his final moved over a little bit, which we discussed with him in smile designing. And also the incisal edges are significantly longer. So that's important to uh, uh, to bring up because if these teeth are longer, it's going to chip them or break them as well. And we don't want that, obviously. So as you can see here, his final result, very nice. So he's got a great tissue response from that. And we want those teeth uh, to continue to look that way for a very long time. And so for that reason, Evan, who smiled like this before, was a little concerned about it, now smiles confidently. He basically gives us, gives us a thumbs up as well, too. He says that now he can go around, smile any way he likes, and he feels comfortable with that. So that's important to know because, you know, many of our patients have wear patterns, right? We just talked about uh, uh, wear patterns where if they look like this grayed out teeth, uh, we'd be fine. But our patients look like this oftentimes. They come to see me at various stages of their life. You know, I see patients that are older. They didn't get in a car accident and break their teeth off like this. They basically wore over time. So it's important for you to identify that because patients will come to you with mild wear, moderate wear, or in this, some cases, excessive wear. And by the time it's excessive wear, we're, we basically lost a lot of our teeth structure. So what do we do? So we already talked about Evan. I would consider him to be kind of like a uh, mild wear situation. You know, he's getting there. He's starting to get oh, you know concerned about it. But I want to show you some moderate wear. So patients who oftentimes will come to see you a little bit older. They're 58 now, right? This is Jason. He's 58. We saw Evan who's 48. So 10 years later, he'd be basically like this. Teeth are basically busted off almost, as he said. He basically is a uh, he's an airline pilot that basically says uh, he's concerned about being a captain of a plane and can't talk to his staff because it looks like he just got in a fight as well. Half teeth missing. So that's 58 years old, Jason. What about a 78 year old man named William? He comes to see me, says, doc, I need some implants. I say, okay, well, where can we put implants? He says, on his lowers. These teeth are kind of um, not there. And I said, you're right, they're not there. So they've taken a while to wear to that, but how did it get there? Again, he didn't get in a car accident last night. He didn't break off those teeth. They wore somehow. And so somewhere along the way, he was 58 year old Jason. And before that, he was 48 year old uh, Evan. So we got to look at our patients and, and, and make sure that we're uh, aware of that and knowing that that can happen to our patients. And it is happening to our patients, especially in these days, day and age with the pandemic and all these um, you know stresses that are in people's lives. People are wearing their teeth. And, and there's a lot of evidence to show that as well. So as I mentioned before, the digital impression is not just taking an imprint. It is a transformation in the way we treat our patients. So definitely, I want you to focus on that as we look forward to how we use the scans now. So as you can see, the objective of implant dentistry is to provide patients with an aesthetic and functional prosthesis. Also a favorite quote of mine. I love this quote because basically it talks about how, you know, it's not, it's not good enough for having things that just work well and not look good. 
But on the other hand, if it looks good, it should work well. You know, we don't have patients who say, you know, this molar, I can't see it, doesn't matter. I think it should still look like a real tooth. And so that's the point of treatment now. So because of that, we got guys like Evan who are extremely happy because, you know, digital treatment planning is how I do everything. I do sessions on treatment planning, how we do digital. But the main goal and key on that is to know that it is important for us to educate our patients. If your patients are educated, they know what's happening. You saw those pictures that I showed Evan, those videos, those 3D renditions of their teeth. That's going to make sure he's educated to know what is possible so that he is now engaged. He basically knows each step of the way so that at the end, he basically says, well, where's my night guard? I think that's the next step. He is engaged in his treatment, so that way he's going to want to proceed. And it's only when people are engaged that they're going to be excited to proceed. You know, patients aren't climbing, uh, clamoring at your door saying, hey, I want to come to the dental chair and get a needle. Like, in fact, that's what everybody doesn't want to get. They basically say, I don't want to go to the dentist. And, you know, I'm sure you've heard this before where they often say, you know, doc, it's not nothing against you, but I don't like being here. I don't like the dentist. And you know, what do you usually say? You say, oh, don't worry, you know, I, I get it all the time, haha. But basically, patients aren't excited to come see you. My patients, if they're educated, they're engaged, and then they're going to be excited to proceed the treatment. So with that being said, that was a quick overview just to kind of, you know, give you a little bit of rationale as to why it's important for us to talk about night guards. Oftentimes, night guards and occlusal splints, they're basically an afterthought. Patients basically finish their treatment. And you say, oh, by the way, um, we should protect your teeth. They say, what? I've all done everything. I, you know, I didn't know about this. I don't want it. In fact, I'm probably going to take it out of my night, you know, in the middle of the night. So we will hear that all the time. So I want to focus on this next section of the of the of the seminar on occlusal night guards. So this is important because you know night guards, like as I mentioned, they're oftentimes an afterthought. Patients don't wear them; they don't like them. They're often too tight. There's a problem with them, and the reason being is because they're not made right. If you make them properly, you're going to basically have patients comfortable. They're going to enjoy it. They're going to basically be able to wear it, not knowing that it's there all the time. So why do we make night guards? There's, you know, many reasons, but you know, I'd say four of the main reasons. And the number one is obviously bruxism. People say, you know, you grind your teeth, you should wear a night guard. But because of that, it's also patients say, I don't grind my teeth. I don't need to wear a night guard. Well, there's many other reasons to wear night guards. You know, people have TMJ issues. Um, you know, they're overloading the joints. They have pain, they have locked jaw, stuff like that. So, you know, there's different types of splints that will design for that. But of course, xerostomia is, is, is kind of common in a lot of patients who have a lot of medications. So you have a lot of elderly patients that could be an issue as well. So oftentimes I've had patients who their mouth is very dry. The lips are just stuck to the teeth, they're very tight. And so basically we're making trays or making night guards or something, a lip bumper, hold things away. So that's another reason. And the last one here I like to put out is retention. Oftentimes people say, well, why would I need a night guard as a retainer? I said, yes. So if you're, if you're doing orthodontics, you know, if you make a holiday appliance or some sort of retainer that sits on the back of the teeth uh, and on the palate, patients could still be grinding their teeth, still wearing away their teeth. So if we make a night guard, we're essentially doing two things. We're retaining the teeth from movement, but also protecting them from any night, guard, uh, uh, night grinding or bruxism. But most importantly is that there's a lot of literature and evidence about implant dentistry and the fact that teeth can move. They can shift natural teeth, but implants don't. So what does that lead to? Overloading of implants. I always make my implants with foil relief so that they're not... Uh, overloading the implant. But what happens is that natural teeth will, will shift. And so if we do a recall in a year, you're going to see that that natural tooth has drifted into place. Now it's contacting that implant. It leads to the screw loosening, leads to um, ceramic fracture, implant failures, uh, bone loss, all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of literature on that. So if we want to maintain that sort of foil relief position that we've created, it's important for us to maintain it, keep it there. So a night guard is very important for us to retain the position of the teeth. So let's say you did an implant on the lower uh, uh, lower left molar. Uh, that implant needs to be slightly out of occlusion from the other teeth. But what if your opposing molar just drifts into place? Well, then we're basically in full occlusion. So if we have an upper night guard, the teeth aren't moving around. They're basically retained in the position where they uh, need to be. So I explain that to every patient even before they have an implant. So basically we've seeded that information. They know that we're talking about a night guard, we're talking about retention of teeth, movement of natural teeth versus implants, and the retention and pr protection, sorry, of the implant. So if you have that sort of information in your patient's minds from the beginning, then they're able to uh, accept that treatment from the at the very end. So anyways, that's a, a little aside, but basically with night guards, very important for us to know that that is uh, some of the reasons. Now, what are the reasons why they don't fit? Well, oftentimes because it's the way they're made. You know, how are, how are night guards made? You know, if, if you're making your own night guards in your office the conventional way, uh, they're not exactly easy to make. They take a long time. Uh, you know, I'm sometimes surprised the lab only charges, you know, the, what they do for it because it takes a long time. But it's basically, according to this literature, the method of making it is similar or the same technique as used in the construction of a complete denture. So it's kind of like making a denture, the acrylic part. So what does that entail? 
um, you know, fabrication steps. Again, if you're making night guards in your office the conventional way, this will be like old hat to you. But for most of us, uh, you're probably not making night guards in your own office the conventional way. But what is involved is many steps. So just to remind you, you know, in case you forgot from dental school, of course, you know, we take a hydrocolloid impression first. That's probably the first one and only thing that we do. Take it, send it away, and it comes back as a night guard. But basically everything you see here is that, you know, we got to pour it you know, immediately, um, there's evidence about what the timing is best, but they also have to use a certain type of stone which has expansion, which they've calculated in. Uh, they factor that into the extension and contraction of other things. Um, you know, you then have to mount it, block out, use wax around the, 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 the teeth, open the pin. You basically have to use base plate wax, mounting things, forming it around it. Then you like, you know, invest it and basically create a, a acrylic pour model of it. It keeps going on. There's step 13, 14, 15, 16, and there's just too much to list. And so as you can see, there's a lot involved in making a classic night guard. And there's also a lot of steps and areas where it can go wrong. So then the question then is, you know, why do we need to do them? And, you know, why do patients not like them? Well, because we get a lot of these same questions. And I'm sure there's, you know, a million other questions that patients have always, or comments patients have said. But some of the main ones that I hear all the time is, I don't grind my teeth. Patients say, I just don't grind my teeth. I snore with my mouth wide open and, you know, I, I, grind, I don't grind my teeth. And so I often say to that, you know, that may be true um, for an eight hour night of sleep. Maybe you're not grinding eight hours. Maybe you're grinding eight minutes. Maybe you're grinding eight seconds or an eighth of a second. Basically, all you need to do is clap your teeth together a few times every single night for your whole life and you're going to basically be wearing your teeth away. And there's a lot of evidence in, to show how the forces are significantly higher than when we're conscious, when we're awake. You know, some literature show up to 30 or 40 times more uh, powerful. That's why people crack and break their teeth. But anyways, I don't grind my teeth is oftentimes what people say. And patients will say, well, why does it have to fit so tight? Well, why does it? It shouldn't fit so tight. They should be fitting well and properly uh, uh, made. And people will say, I hate this night guard. It's so uncomfortable. I hear it all the time. We just say, thank you for recommending it. My dentist made it before. I ended up at the end of the bed. I just took it off. So basically, patients aren't comfortable with it. And there's a reason, as I just mentioned there. So uh, if we can make it better, I'm going to guarantee you that patients are going to want to wear them more. So if we look to uh, Facebook, our everyday life, right? Facebook. Uh, I looked at dental clinical pearls. This is uh, something that was posted yesterday, 8 o'clock at night. You know, what is it? Basically, it says, I'm on the fourth remake of a maxillary night guard. Uh, fourth remake. Wow, it should be zero remakes. But anyways, this dentist is up in arms. He's kind of concerned. He says, why is it fitting so tight? It was very tight on the cast and the patient's mouth. Still scraping. Shouldn't be tight anywhere. Shouldn't be tight in the patient's mouth or the, or the cast. There's something wrong here. He says, is anyone else having similar issues? If you think you're the only one having problems with night guards fitting, uh, I'm sure, you know, as you can see, many people are having that same issue. So remember, last night, 807, we would have 135 comments. I mean, people are all like, you know, banding together around a campfire talking about this kind of stuff. About how come the night guards don't fit? No, I'm just kidding. But basically, we need to know that it is a, a, a sort of an issue. And that's why patients aren't wearing them. Remember, as we talked about, this is how we take the, that impression, right? The, the reason why we take an impression gently and carefully is because, as you can see on the right side, there is nothing touching the teeth. Those teeth are in a relaxed floating position in the PDL. The PDL is not activated. When you mix an alginate and you push it into the patient's mouth, you are now activating orthodontically those teeth. You're pushing them into the sulcus or the socket and basically activating the PDL. You snap remove the, the, the impression and those teeth have now shifted or moved. You look in the tray and you see, you know, a cusp show through of a part of your tray. You say, it looks good. We got everything we needed. But now you realize that that single tooth is now compressed more than the others because it touched the tray. So because of that, when your impression is poured, it's made with activated teeth. You put your night guard in the patient's mouth, no matter how good your lab technician is, you're basically activating the teeth where it was when you took the impression. So that already gives you a bad start. As you can see, it is a transformation in the way we treat our patients. So patients are going to put their night guard in with the teeth in a relaxed position, just like it was scanned. So that's why, you know, alone, that is already going to make a big difference for us. So we already talked about the digital impressions, what it is and why we do it that way. So we don't need to talk about that part again, but we're going to talk about what the workflow is. What is the workflow of making a night guard? So we already talked about the rationale, why your patients need it. Let's talk about how we use it how we make it. So I'm going to tell you that there's basically four simple steps, four very easy steps that we can use to make night guards in, in office. Now, if you make it outside of office, if you make it in your lab, of course, it's, you know less steps for you, but lots of steps for the lab. But basically, this is allowing us to now be able to do things in your office, literally chair side. So what is involved? Of course, first, we have to do a scan, digital scan. You can't do this with a you know, conventional impression. It's going to take it's just impractical. You can't really do this workflow with a conventional impression. If you take a digital scan, then you make a design. I'm going to show you how I design that and, and design on the software, and then you print it. 
Once you print it, you post process it and you're ready to go. Now, what is the flow? What is the flow of all this? Now, as you can see, you know, what is a good number that people have said before? An hour and 55 minutes, that's two hours to make a night guard. I mean, it doesn't sound like a lot of time, but it sounds pretty good, right? You can basically scan it, prepare it, print it, wash, dry, cure it, and you're good to go. But that is an hour and 55 minutes. That takes a bunch of time. So someone in your office, a staff member, someone's going to be making that, you know, if you have an in-house lab technician or somebody doing it. But what if I told you that now the flow is even faster? We're able to do something like from start to finish in 54 minutes or less. 54 minutes, that's like less than an hour. That properly makes something now, like making a night guard, chair side. So we can actually make a night guard for a patient same day when they're waiting, go to the washroom, go have lunch, come back, we got a night guard for them. So basically that is important to know because some of my patients, and I don't know about your patients, but they sometimes they wear, they're religiously wearing their night guard. They can't go one night where they're wear, wearing the night guard. I've had many patients where we build up a very complicated restoration and they say, I can't sleep if I, if I go night, one night without a night guard. So we're making night guards for them in 54 minutes. So that's important to know because that workflow is, 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 is extremely fast now. And Sprint Ray has done this really amazing job coming out of the way as, I, as you saw there, four minutes to cure everything. So we've already talked about the scan. We don't need to keep talking about the scan because uh, you know basically I scan a patient every single time and that's me getting ready to scan our patients. But basically we uh, I use a Trios 4, uh, I use Trios 3 before that. I like it because it, it scans in color. It basically allows us to see everything. It, you know, basically patients look over and they hear the clicking noise. They look at their own teeth and they say, what is this, what is that? And it basically creates a conversation for them. But once we scan it, we gotta go ahead and design it somehow. So I'm gonna show you how I design using Three Shapes Splint Studio. So Splint Studio is a software which is amazingly powerful. Basically it's, uh, and simple. And basically all it does is design splints. And so basically what it does is it designs it for any shape of splint that you wanna do. Whether you are doing this for TMJ disorders, sleep disorders, or you wanna make fangs for Halloween, which is past here. Uh, but basically, you know, the simplicity of it is it integrates perfectly with your scanner, Trio scanner, or the lab scanner if you have a lab scanner. But allows us to then do the virtual articulation, which I kind of mentioned uh, how important that is. But uh, if you're not doing it with the, you know, special face, you know, images and stuff, you're still gonna get a very accurate uh, articulation from it. So what, what can we do with Splint Studio? Uh, you know, people say, I like to make a special splint that I heard somewhere, you know, in a lecture. Well, basically anything you see here or anything you can come up with, you can make. It basically makes splints shapes and you can morph it to whatever you want. So if you wanna make a, um, you know, like I said, fangs for, Kate, for for Halloween. If you want to make anything the way that you see here, you can make that. So Splint Studio allows you to design everything. But all you need and what you need from that first is a scan. You can't do this with a conventional impression. If you did, you have to scan it into the computer and then do it, which is kind of redundant. You're losing a lot of accuracy and speed, obviously, but it is possible if you needed to. So you adapt it, you design it, and then you mill or print it. Uh, in my case, I like to print them because I have full control about the printing. Now with Splint Studio, I'm gonna show you basically how simple it is for those of you who are using uh, three shape systems of any type. Basically they make things very simple. They basically have a step-by-step -step workflow along the top. You can't move to the next step without uh, uh, proceeding for the next one. So it's very easy to follow. They also have warnings to let you know sort of if anything's missing or anything's wrong. So of course, if there's any issues with it, it's very important for you to look out for these warning bells, but it basically tells you how to do that. So how is it done? This is a very uh, comprehensive sort of look as to how I do it in my office, but basically, you bring a scan in, very easy. Uh, you know, basically uh, within 10 minutes, I can get a full night guard done. But for those of you just starting, you know, maybe take a little longer, but uh, basically down to 10, actually eight minutes, I used the other one last time. But here you do, you choose your, your printer, you basically select the position of the teeth, uh, you know, and then basically you cut away and trim away any areas just to make sure that it articulates nicely. Otherwise it gets held up. Here's a digital articulator. If you use the, the standard setup, uh, it already kind of pre-opens the, the pin for you. You know, and you request to open a pin by X number of millimeters. It just does that for you. And so then you can set that to wherever you like, do the articulation. If you really got uh, really detailed into it, you can program in the actual articulation sides, but we'll just skip that to show you. Uh, but basically it just gives us a little bit of the grinding habit and position there. So once you do that, then we survey the cast. Uh, as you've, any of you have ever, surveyed a denture or anything like that, you know that you put a, like a little, you know, a pin and you basically survey around it. This is surveying for you. You basically select where you wanna have uh, uh, you know undercuts, then you can wax and, and block out anything. In this case, there's some lingual wires there, so you wanna make sure we prevent 
No anything gripping onto there. Any uh, deep undercuts you want to uh, wax and, and block that out. Then you go ahead and you select off the, the shape in which you want. This is where you can kind of shape anything you like. If you want to go along the palette and give it a nice shape, you want to go all the way, cover the palette, you want to go up on the teeth, you basically select to wherever you want. And then the computer will then design it uh, based on wherever you've outlined. So the outline is very quick, it's very easy. And once you get that in there, then uh, you can select the plane of occlusion. Oftentimes people will say, well, how, you know, do you want flat plane? Do you want it with guidance? Uh, you can select very simply to select the whole arch with just match to the teeth. So sort of flat plane with some grooves. You can do extremely flat plane. It's just highlighted there. Basically shows it's going to be completely flat all the way across. Or you can do it with um, guidance ramps. So for me, I don't guidance the entire uh, arch. I like to do guidance ramp on sort of the canine to canine and anterior area and then uh, sort of adapt to the teeth on the posterior area here. So as you can see, once it, it, it does that, it automatically creates like a crystal looking night guard for you. And then you go ahead and you just monitor or sort of change it up yourself. So you add and subtract and you can add wax, uh, delete wax. You can, you can run through articulations, which is nice. It, as I mentioned there, it gives you notifications if something's missing or wrong. As you can see here, all the contact points are good. We're running through the articulation now, the blue and the black, showing lateral and protrusive movements. Uh, we can go in and, and build it in with a bite because it's on an articulator. So it basically can create the grooves that we want. We can then pull in more wax, delete more wax, add to wherever you want until you get good occlusion. Now I'm gonna tell you that basically whatever you put in here, it's gonna print it for you that way, literally. Like it literally comes out looking the way that you put it. Every dot that you put in prints out that way. So that's amazing. And so once you get the uh, the excursion and the, the movements that you want, then you go ahead and you uh, uh, finish it up, you know, shape it whatever shape you want. And you go ahead and you get ready to print it. So I like to put a little name on the side of it, nameplate. I'm going to go ahead and save it there. Okay, so once it's designed, we got to go printing. So printing is where it's exciting because, you know, oftentimes pe people will say, you know, is printing there yet? Is 3D printing there? I mean, I'll maybe wait five years. Well, let's just look to our everyday life, YouTube. So if you're using YouTube 3D printing, you're gonna find various different types of 3D printing. You know, we got the one on the very left here. It basically is like a filament printer. It just is beating in melted uh, plastic and it creates it. It's not very accurate for what we need, but you can make toys and other things. Go to the opposite extreme. You can go to Dubai and see them printing the world's biggest 3D printed building. Of course, in Dubai, right? They have a 9.5 meter tall building that's 3D printed. It's crazy. So then my favorite shows is Top Gear. I love Top Gear, they talk about cars all the time, but here they have the world's first 3D printed hypercar. 3D printed hypercar. So they're printing metal, they're printing all this, you know, parts to the car. So when someone says to you, I don't think 3D printing's there yet. I mean, maybe we'll wait five years. I mean, clearly they're able to print uh, uh, hypercar tolerance of materials. So for us, I think in what we need for dentistry, I certainly believe it's there already. So if you look to just everyday life, we see technology has moved dramatically. So if you look at 3D printing, you know, there's so many different printers to choose from. Uh, you know, I'm not trying to tell you which one or the other, but you'll just know that some of these printers are made for other industries, but I focus on the one that I like to use. And that is the, the one that, uh, uh, that I'm gonna talk about here. But before we go to that, we're gonna talk about the two different types of printers, stereolithography and DLP. Steel lithography is the old style. Essentially, it's like a light cure that does a you know a little bit at a time. It takes forever for a night guard. I think probably overnight, probably like a twelve hour print. Uh, but if we use a now updated version, which is called DLP, digital light processing, it uses mirrors and basically is able to light cure very quickly just where you need it. And so it can do a night guard in forty five minutes if you stand it upright. It's very tall, maybe an hour and a half. But basically, you have nice and thin. I'm looking about forty minutes to print it. Thirty minutes sometimes uh, for some designs. But I choose to use, uh, and I'm using the Sprint Ray printer uh, because they're made for and designed for dentistry. And so because of that, the application is very straightforward for us, for what we need. It's basically meant with a printing platform that's shaped and sized for uh, digital or for dentistry. So for models, for night guards, uh, and it makes it very easy. Touch screen. You basically go in and you design it, uh, much like printing anything from your you know Word document on your computer. You press print, you go ahead, and it just starts printing. Now, just like your printer at home, you got to put in paper. Well, here you put in type of acrylic. What are you going to use? And so you basically put that and you press print. Very easy. And then the light gets going and we start printing. So the important thing for you to look at is if you're deciding on type of printer, I like a printer that has many applications. You know, we're making uh, surgical guides, models, night guards. That's important because some of them can only print one thing. And then you have a printer that does nothing but one thing. So it's important for you to know that you can do that. But it's also important uh, then to figure out, well, how do you use the printer? So I'm going to show you a little bit about how easy it is for them to use this. So um, 
the Spring Ray system basically comes out with this thing called Rayware. It's essentially, it's a software that they've developed that makes it very easy for you to take a scan and use it. Because if you take a scan, you can't print it directly from your three shape scanner. You've got to import it into a system where then it kind of manipulates the, the scan to put it on that printing plate. So what you see here is that printing plate on the right hand side. And when the printing plate is basically the plate that comes upwards, which you'll see in a video that I have coming up, uh, we have to line it up so that it all fits within that, uh, that plate. But as you can see here, you know, what, what do we, how do we design it? How do we put it on there? The good thing about this Rayware system is that it's very simple for us to use. It, it basically allows us to use various different things. But one of the things I like is that it allows me to use th third party resins. Third party resins is important because, you know, Sprint Ray makes great uh, resins and I use a lot of them, but some of them, you know, you want to be able to use other systems. And now a lot of the printers don't allow you to do that. They only allow you and lock you into using one type of resin, their own type. So then if they don't have the right one you want or the right density or the right materials, you end up stuck with that one. So the good thing about this is that it allows and opens up the door to using basically like any resin that you want for printing splints. I like using this uh, key, key, uh, keystone material, key splint soft. That's really good. And I print with that. And there's also soft material that uh, uh, the Sprint Ray themselves has made, which is also very good. And I use that as well. But the flexibility in using third party resins is uh, something that I think Sprint Ray is really focused on and allowing them to do so, which has been very, very helpful. Um, but the other thing is model basing. How do you do that? Remember, a, a scan comes in, it's just an arch. So it looks like this. You bring it in and then what do you do? You gotta click this button that says fix. Very easy. Once you click fix, it just pops some line, some, some supports onto it. And these supports can be either string or, or sort of like little lines that you see in the middle there, or an actual base. You can actually create a base for models. Uh, if you're making um, you know, splints or if you're making surgical guides, then you want these little like spider finger that are on there because they print with those to hold it in place as it prints. And then you take those off and just trim it off very easily. So um, I like how it makes dental, you know, the model basing and also the, the supports very easily. But what's very nice about it is this thing called pixel toning. So pixel toning, and you know, sometimes you see 3D prints, they look pretty good, but they have a lot of lines on them. What Sprint Ray has done is they've really kind of uh, uh, focused on making sure that these prints are very detailed. So you see on the left hand side here, this is the baseline. This is sort of just normal printing. You see layer by layer, you see every layer of them. Well, if they bring those layers closer together, it prints a little longer, but they're making those layers tighter. Everything's closer. You see on the right hand side picture, very smooth. And so when you get that really smooth outcome, that's amazing for obviously, you know, if you're making aligners, you're making anything like that, or even just models, everything's much smoother. So pixel toning, very helpful for us to use in that. So then once you print, you know, you know, I have that on the on the base there. I go ahead and print. What is the steps? Well, first of all, I've put them upright on the screen here, as you can see here. I rotate around. Then the computer tells me, you know, where how much you know, uh, acrylic to put in. It basically, says, you know, fill to the minimum, middle, or maximum amount. There's like a little line there. So basically, I fill it up with that. I put the acrylic, pour it in. Once you pour the acrylic in, then basically uh, you press print. And as I mentioned before, like going to your printer at home, you just press print and it goes ahead and just prints it for you. And so that's important to, to, to see. And that's very easy because then once you go ahead and you go to the printer and it just starts printing, you basically see, you know, layer by layer, it says three hours because this one I tried to print it like upright, it's very tall, something else, but I can print a night guard in about 40 minutes uh, or less. So it's really nice uh, if you lay it down flat with uh, good supports. Then once it's uh, all done printing, then we go ahead and we uh, we take a look at it. Now you have dripping like T1000 coming out of the, the, the metal, right? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it's a reference to the old movies. But anyways, uh, as you can see here, uh, night guards are ready. So what do we do after that? We gotta process it. We can't just put it in a page's mouth dripping wet like that, right? So what do we do? We gotta wash it. We gotta clean these guys up. So classically how we clean and wash them is that uh, you use isopropyl alcohol and it's vibration. So basically we put it in our ultrasonic Obviously don't pour your uh, ultrasonic full of ultrapropyl alcohol, put it in a bag or others, and then you rinse it and, and, and in isopropyl alcohol, scrub it off, and then you blow dry it. But Sprint Ray's been really good about making uh, it simpler for you. It's like a dishwasher. You know, how many of you love doing dishes every night? Well, I don't, but I like using my dishwasher. So what I do is I put dishes in the dishwasher and it's done the next morning. Well here, it's simplified it for us. We take it out from the printer and we put it right into the sort of the washer and then it cleans it up for you. And so uh, in minutes, we're, we're nice and cleaned and ready to go. So it cleans and washes it all completely out, and then you take it off, you just take it off uh, off the, the base and you're ready to use it. So what do we do with it then? We can't just use it again, it's still not ready yet. We gotta cure it. So remember, all this is light cured material, so we gotta final cure it. So this is the uh, Procure 1. This is basically the cure machine, and I call it the 
uh, the rave box or the club box. No, just kidding. It basically looks like a little uh, nightclub, right? But basically you put the, the, the splints, the models, anything in there, and a light cures it for you. Uh, basically finishes it up in about uh, 15 minutes or so. Some of the older cure systems or other brands would be like 40 minutes, half an hour, long time. Uh, that's sort of why getting things take a long time. But what is exciting is that the Sprint Ray has literally just announced and released what's called the Procure 2. So Procure, Procure 2 is a extremely fast cure that's now even faster than the one that I'm using uh, right here, the Procure 1. And so Procure 2 is essentially is a system that now has a light and motion drive that basically lights cures extremely fast. So we're talking so fast that within minutes, you're basically able to cure your, 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 your your night guards and your splints. So for example, if you had a surgical guide, if you had a night guard, we're talking two minutes of light cure. Two minutes, can't even microwave my food fast enough for that, two minutes. But basically now, once you process, print, clean it up, cure it for two minutes, you're ready to put in your patient's mouth. That is huge because, you know, what was used to be 15 minutes for me is now, you know, two minutes for the cure. That doesn't sound like a whole lot, but sometimes in those cases where you just need it, it is definitely faster and better. So because of that, not that the Procure 1 is extremely slow, it's just the Procure 2 is extremely fast. So that's something that's really neat. And I think that um, uh, Sprint Ray has been amazing to kind of push forward in the technology to make that happen, because that's gonna be what makes it possible for us to do chair side. Okay, so as I mentioned, why do we need to do chair side? You know, we have many patients who, who go through a series of uh, uh, treatments and they don't, you know, like having, you know, a one night without a night guard, right? And so I'm going to show you a case in which uh, basically a patient has come to see me and basically had a, had, had a bad accident. They basically had a car accident and a surgeon placed a bunch of implants. And she told me that she can't go one night without a night guard. She can't go one night without a night guard. And so after we inserted these beautiful restorations. She said, I need to have the night guard tonight or else I can't sleep. I'm just, I won't be able to sleep. And so we scanned her teeth, made a night guard, and that same day we delivered it for her. And so this is what it looks like. Basically a night guard printed out of, uh, this is the uh, key splint soft material. Uh, it's not soft, it's actually hard, but it's dual soft. Basically it's hard and a hard acrylic, warm it up with a little bit of warm water, and then you can insert that and have it nicely fitted for the patient. So you can see here, this is no adjustments. This is literally straight from the, the, the post processing. Very nice, fits right in place. Doesn't feel like there's anything sort of compressing the gums or the teeth or anything at all. And as you can see the guidance pattern that we've created, you can see the, the protrusive movements, the lateral guidance, there you go. You have opening on as you move to the left and the right side. And so this is extremely beneficial for our patients. And in her case, she went home happy. She had a beautiful restoration. She basically had teeth that she could uh, protect and be able to sleep well that night because she had a night guard. So you can see here, this is designed, uh, again, Smith Studio basically designed everything on there for us. We had it very nice. But I wanna show you another patient who then, who has been wearing a night guard pretty much his whole life as well. But let me see you his testimony. I'll show you his testimony and see what he says here. Oh, there may not be any sound here. Okay, so basically the same thing for him. But basically once we put this night guard in, we were able to basically have him wear this night guard and have no concerns with the way the bite. So if he, when he sits up, he basically talks about how, you know, he had a night guard before that had clasps. He basically had all these clasps that held onto the teeth so tight. He doesn't like the night guard. He doesn't like wearing night guards, but he still wears it every night. It's sort of a habit, but he just doesn't like it. Once we made this night guard for him, he said, wow, it feels amazing. In fact, I didn't even know that it was in yet. He, pre he literally says, it feels like I'm not even wearing the night guard. That's how comfortable this 3D printed night guard was. Remember I mentioned, when you take this impression, we're not activating the teeth. The teeth are scanned in the relaxed position. So the night guard is now inserted in a relaxed position, keeps the teeth in that same position. So for that reason, patients are feeling time and time again that they're great. You know, over the last, you know, maybe couple hundred night guards that I've made, I've had to remake one of them. And that wasn't because of fitment. It's just because, you know, I maybe designed it a little bit wrong and a little bit too thick. So with that said, we basically don't have to remake any night guards. And so this is extremely beneficial for your patients, very extremely beneficial for the way we do dentistry and makes things much more efficient. So as we talked about lots of different things today, um, you know, the four main steps is we talked about scanning, we talked about designing, printing and post-processing. Four simple steps. Once you do those steps, you're basically able to get chair side uh, uh, splints for your patients. Extremely important because I firmly believe that with proper treatment planning, we're going to have better outcomes. I always say this all the time is that, you know, my patients know about the night guards before we even started anything at the beginning. And that's because I always begin with the end in mind. It's very important for us to begin that way because otherwise, you know, if, you're, if you have no idea how the end point is going to be and you just start cutting teeth and start preparing things, patients will have no idea what's happening. And also they won't 
uh, buy into the treatment philosophy as to what we're mentioning here, protecting their teeth. So as I've mentioned lots before, digital impressions is not just taking an imprint, but a transformation in the way of patient treatment. It is not possible for you to do this sort of same day chair side night guard splint production for any of your patients if you're taking an alginate impression. You know, it's taken longer for you to pour it, trim it, and get it ready than we already have a night guard ready for our patients. So that is a transformation in the way of tra patient treatment. So as I mentioned before, you know, this, the cell phones, you know, that's done something really good for us in our lives. It's changed the way we do things, maybe sometimes not for the better because, you know, we're always on our phones. But the long story short is that it's changed the way that we communicate. It's changed in our own life, as well as in, in technology, where digital technology has changed the way we do dentistry, going from a physical wax up to a digital uh, wax up. Huge difference, huge difference. But for splints specifically, if you look at the way it's conventionally made, like a denture, we're basically taking many steps to make something as you see here on the bottom left hand side here. But with digital, we're now able to uh, expedite and, and make more efficient that workflow. As you can see here, I have uh, five of them on one tray. Print five of them at one time. If you're a lab or you know an in-house lab, the efficiency of that is amazing, right? I can design them all and have my staff making them all at one time as opposed to one at a time. So as you can see here, you know, the, the quote that we started out with was, whosoever desires constant success must change conduct with the times. As you can see clearly, the times are changing. So we bring it back to something a little more current. So here in, uh, in 2021, we say, uh, I like the uh, quote from the great one. You know, here in, in, in Vancouver, you know, we love hockey. I grew up in, in, a, in a country of hockey. Basically, Wayne Gretzky, who's the greatest hockey player of all time, says, go where the puck is going. Go, go where the puck is going. He didn't say, I'm going to stand still and, and, you know, just watch the puck go past me. Or I'm going to turn the other way and skate the other way. He's the best in the game because he chased after it. He was going down ice when the puck goes down ice. As we know in dentistry, everything is moving in towards the digital dentistry. It is not almost there yet. It is not five years from now. It is here now. And as you can see, the technology allows us to change the way we do dentistry completely. So I thank you so much for your time. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, my um, contact is the easiest to get in touch with me. I want to make sure that you have a chance to really uh, ask, ask your questions and have them answered if we need to. Uh, Instagram is the fastest way to get in touch with me. So if you have any questions about things, please do uh, let me uh, know. But I think we have uh, maybe a couple minutes just for a couple questions. I think we do have a couple that have come in. So let me see a, a couple of questions. Uh, okay, someone had asked, uh, can this be done with conventional impressions? Uh, and as I mentioned throughout this lecture and uh, this time, um, this workflow can't be done with digital or conventional impressions. I mean, you can scan a physical model and have your lab make it for you, um, design it, I guess, but it kind of defeats the purpose. You know, the whole chair side idea that we talked about is the fact that the digital impression is so accurate and so fast. So if you did it conventionally, uh, you might as well just kind of go with the conventional way. However, your lab is probably doing it the digital way anyways. If you send them an alginate impression, they're probably no longer packing it the way that they would do a conventional. They're probably doing this digital way anyways. They scan it in, design it, and 3D print it. I almost guarantee you at least all the big labs are doing that now. Okay, um, next question. What if I don't want to design splints? Like I don't want to design splints like on a computer. Okay, that's a good question because you know I like you know technology and I design things. And for those of you who don't want to kind of click around and make the splints, you don't have to. Uh, you know, there's lots of cloud-based software. In fact, uh, uh, Sprint Ray actually has one of their own cloud softwares where you can send it away to them. They can design it for you and they can send it back to the file and then you print it. So that's also quite efficient, but of course there's a cost with that. But if you design it yourself, you have full control over everything. So there's there's different ways you can do it. You don't have to necessarily design your own. You have the scanner, you can send it away. And within, you know, again, if you coordinate and plan it, you can have that still uh, uh, printed the same day. You can still have everything sent back to you and you can uh, the file type and, 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 and print it. So that's really good. All right, um, last one. Do I have to make them same day? Uh, no, you certainly do not have to make your night guard same day. I mean, we were talking about how the option is there, which is great, but there's by no means the need to rush yourself to make this night guard, to scan it and make it right away. But the good thing about it is that we, and, and just to really show and highlight the power of this digital technology, which allows us to do that. Because again, never before were you able to do this, but now with digital technology, we have the ability to do that. So certainly you don't have to do it, you know, same day, you know, not all of mine are made same day. There's no way I can efficiently do that and still have a, you know, do my practice the way I do it. But just when I need to, it's kind of like a tool in my back pocket that I can use when I need to. But most of mine, we scan it and we kind of line them up and design a few of them at the same time and then uh, print them all at the same time. So uh, you certainly can kind of do whatever you want with that. So uh, either way. So 
Okay, so I think we're just running out of time, but if you didn't get your questions answered uh, or you have more questions, follow me on Instagram. That's the easiest way to get in touch with me, Vancouver Pros. You'll see some of these videos, uh, you know, pictures of how I do some of this technology and as anything new that comes out, it's always there. But I hope to keep in touch with you. And uh, as I said, technology is there. We're here and we're doing everything this way. And so I hope that it's hopefully going to change the way you do things in your practice as well. All right, thanks very much. See ya.